Shipwrecks are entities of special value in the archaeological record for several reasons. First, they are the remains of a cultural and environmental paradox. People have always acknowledged the water as a physical barrier, a frontier or another world. Yet, at the same time, rivers, lakes and seas connected societies because ships sailed on them. Ships are mobile micro-societies with small group of people moving from harbour to harbour. If they sink and root, unique cultural links are created in the archaeological record, links we cannot always detect from excavating land sites. For example, the Mazoto ship left the island of Chios in the northern Aegean and wrecked more than 500 miles farther south off the coast of Cyprus. We do not know if the island was its final destination. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't even know that the ship had ever traveled in the seas of Cyprus. It did sink, however, and because of this unfortunate event, an Aegean micro-society became part of Cypriot archaeology. And no other kind of archaeological site can provide more direct evidence for mobility, connectivity and seaborne trade than a shipwreck, especially when it preserves cargo remains. Now the question is, what is the Mazotos shipwreck and why is it important? This is a Greek ship wrecked off the south coast of Cyprus near the modern village of Mazotos, sometime between 400 and 350 BC. It transported a primary cargo of wine from the island of Chios as some secondary cargo such as wine jugs and possibly olives. The shipwreck remained almost undisturbed for 2400 years until 2010 when excavation was undertaken by a team from the University of Cyprus in collaboration with the Department of Antiquities. It is now one of the very few pre-Roman wreck sites currently under excavation in the entire Mediterranean. As we know very little about Greek ships of the classical period, which is the 5th and the 4th centuries BC, the study of the Mazotos ship is expected to fill a serious gap in the history of ancient shipbuilding, seafaring and seaborne trade. Nothing is left from the upper part of the wooden hull due to the natural deterioration processes. The cargo amphorae were so densely stowed, however, that favorable conditions were created for the preservation of the lower part of the ship, which was buried under the sand. This is a homogeneous cargo of approximately 800 amphorae, i.e. ceramic containers made specifically for carrying organic commodities like wine by sea. The fact that the cargo arrangement has undergone no major disturbance since the wreckage episode allows the study of the amphora storage system in the ship's hold, thanks to the accurate digital recordings of each one of the cargo amphora. These recordings have been made and used since the beginning of the project, and now we can gain unique insights into the way that ancient mariners managed the ship's internal space. This is a coherent body of evidence that can also shed more light on the specifics of shipping commodities in antiquity and the mechanisms of seaborne trade. For example, the possible trading stops of the ship on the way to its final destination, the degree of transport amphora standardization or the typology of the Kian amphora in particular, i.e. their size, shape, features, provenance, etc. There are several steps that all archaeologists should follow in an excavation, on land or under the water. They have to document in detail the exposed finds, remove them without jeopardizing their integrity, secure their safe treatment and storage, make sure that they are properly studied, and disseminate the results through scientific publications, exhibitions, or other public outreach media. Accurate mapping and digging take most of an underwater excavation's time and energy. Mapping a site means recording the position of every mobile and immobile find before excavation and or recovery. 
In order to do so, all artifacts or structures must be given a code number, photographed in situ, that means as they are found, and then placed in their spatial context. For this, several methods can be used. From Azotos, we chose photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is a contactless 3D measuring method which uses photographs as the recording medium. Post-processing of these photos is required to extract meaningful measurements about an object's size, shape and position. It is a versatile technique able to adapt to several applications. The main advantage of the method is that the accuracy depends on the object to camera distance. By object we mean the area of or find that needs to be modeled. Hence, one may take photos close up and have increased accuracy and excellent detail, or else move further away to cover larger areas. Modern algorithms and improved computer power have automated many steps of post-processing while at the same time allowing the use of less expensive uncalibrated cameras. These are the main reasons why photogrammetry or image-based modeling has become so popular recently. The main shortcoming is that the method depends on a proper and dense camera positioning layout around the object to fully cover all aspects and undercuts of it. This is very tricky since one cannot be certain of properly covering the object with photos until after the post-processing, usually when already left the site or the site has changed. Laser scanning is the only alternative to photogrammetry for recording dense and detailed information underwater. Nevertheless, it is slower, more expensive, has limited area coverage and may only provide a dense point cloud without texture information. So given the restrictions of the environment and the requirements of archaeological documentation, photogrammetry is the best option in terms of delivered product, affordability, ease and speed of acquisition. This fact has been confirmed by the wide implementation of the method to underwater wreck sites all around the world. In order to understand the challenges of mapping the Mazotos archaeological site, we need to comprehend the demands of the mapping documentation and the environmental restrictions. The increased depth imposes severe time limitations which adds to the stress of the technical diving itself. Stress and nitrogen narcosis make photography a difficult task, especially when considering that all necessary photos for a detailed 3D model must be acquired and processed before any fine removal. Lighting conditions at 45 meters depth are also restricting since natural light in such depth is limited. Therefore, we have to use artificial lighting to get color photographs for creating photorealistic 3D models. Excavating a shipwreck at 45 meters presents a lot of challenges. For example, although that the diver's hand remains the most sensitive, accurate and useful tool for digging underwater, removal of sand requires the use of specific devices, the airlift or the water dredge. In order to install and use these tools, originally invented for other industry, but now ubiquitous in the water archaeology, training and expertise are necessary. The team members should also be able to work on boat for many hours every day, operate with special equipment and most important, keep safe. The main challenge, however, concerns diving, with the degree of difficulty increasing exponentially when the waters are deep and the site is far from the coast. Skills of technical diving are absolutely necessary for the divers, who have to perform their best during the limited bottom time they are allowed daily. At Mazotos, this is usually 20 to 25 minutes per day. Every minute counts, and more often than not, a small mistake can waste the entire dive. Before going into the water, divers have to gear up, plan and time their dive carefully. While in the water, they have to coordinate with partners, execute their tasks with precision and keep track of their time, which passes far too quickly underwater. 
and all that while fighting the effects of deep waters. Nitrogen narcosis can seriously impair the diver's judgment. This can be an extremely stressful process, one that requires mental concentration and physical efficiency. On the positive side, each successful dive is a small personal triumph for all of us, which is a very rewarding feeling that keeps the team going. As Colin Pearson wrote, excavation without conservation is vandalism. After being brought to the surface, all finds need to remain wet and go through treatment before they dry. Desalination is an important process that can take months, but is necessary for all waterlogged artifacts whose material has been saturated with salt water after centuries in the sea. The reason is that salt gets crystallized as it dries and can affect the structure of most materials. Mechanical or chemical damages are also treated in the lab before the finds are stored or exhibited in a museum. The question is what an ancient shipwreck looks like. Ancient ships were made of wood, an organic material that deteriorates fast when exposed in the water. Only the parts of the hull that are buried under the sand can be actually preserved. And in the Mediterranean, at least, we should not expect to find the ships themselves without excavation. What we do find on the seafloor, most of the times, are the remains of the ship's cargo items. Depending on how a ship sinks, and on what type of seafloor it lands on, different types of shipwreck sites may be created. On flat, sandy seafloors, we usually find the better preserved shipwrecks. On rocky ones, the ships broke apart and their cargo was scattered before or soon after the wrecking episode. If the cargo was organic, for example, grain, timber or textiles, it would have decayed soon after the wreckage and very little would be left for archaeologists to discover. Pottery, metal and stone artifacts, however, can be better preserved. And in the case of scattered shipwreck sites, numerous half-buried, intact or broken pieces can be found dropped randomly at some distance from another. So this is what we usually find on the seafloor. Now let's see what is my job as the excavation director. The director of a systematic archaeological excavation is a qualified archaeologist who has full responsibility during all stages of an excavation, from the fieldwork itself to the study of the material afterwards. He or she constructs the research plan and the methodology to be followed, secures the funding, chooses the team, coordinates the work, and makes final decisions on almost every aspect of the process.